All right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the day one at KubeCon. I hope you are having a very good experience so far. So my name is Natesh. I am currently uh, working as a Linux Foundation main team with the Kubernetes Release Engineering team, um, where I'm working uh, to building a Golang library and CLI tool. So when I started contributing to the Kubernetes for the very first time, it was overwhelming, you know, with a bunch of meetings happening around, everything going so far. It was very overwhelming for me, and I think it's overwhelming for any of the students so far. Um, and that is the reason I was thinking of having a panel discussion with the folks who started their way as students on how folks can also get started their contribution to the kids. And when I say students, you do not mean that you may be starting in a college. No. If you're, maybe you're a maintainer to some project, but you want to get started with the contribution to kids, right? So you're a student to that project, right? So we have an amazing panel members uh, who'll be sharing their own experiences on how they get, got started as students and where are they currently at. So I'll be starting with an introduction. So uh, Leonardo, would you like to start an introduction about yourself? Yes, sure. Uh, my name is Leo. I started contributing to open source like two and a half, three years ago. Um, for the most part, contributing to the release team, uh, Kubernetes SIG release, um, but also for the last one and a half or two years more to the CNCF. Um, I started with some amazing folks, the Technical Advisory Group for Environment Sustainability. Maybe you saw it on the keynotes today. Um, I'm mostly around, around there now. Oh, hi everyone, I'm Faika, and I started contributing to Kubernetes just last year. So for me, it was obviously a very overwhelming project, just like for any one of us, just beginning. I was a student, I was very new to cloud native, I did not know what exactly anything is. So I began it with SIG Contribux comms, and that's how my journey began. Right now, I am a SIG uh, release lead shadow for V1.29 release, and I'm also an LFX mentee at Istio. So yeah, that's it. That's about me. Hello, everyone. So myself, Meha Balodia. Uh, I have started my uh, open source journey in my second year of the college, and I have been uh, contributing to the Kubernetes in the release teams. Like I have been shadowed two times in the docs, then CI signal, and I have been a lead in the CI signal in 1.28. And right now I am a release lead shadow, and yes, working uh, at Red Hat uh, with the OpenShift GitOps team. So yes. Hi everyone, my name is Grace. Um, I'm finishing my undergrad next year at Waterloo. I've been contributing um, in the Kubernetes project for over two years, starting um, in the pandemic because I didn't have anything else to do with my time. Um, I led the release of Kubernetes 1.28 planter daddies that just came out in August. Um, I also work closely with SIG Security and help out with um, their security self-assessment uh, sub-project. That's awesome. So. Taking an introduction of the panel members, you could literally sense how can the, this panel discussion can be helpful for any one of you. So starting with the first question, if any one of the student tries to get involved with the KH ecosystem, the first fancy word that comes in the KH is SIGs or special interest group. And to be very honest, there's a uh, GitHub repo called as KH slash community. It contains information of every SIG, what is the SIG does, right? So starting with you, right, like how, would you like to explain how do one um, navigate the Kate slash community repo, probably understanding how the SIGs are working or how can get uh, someone get involved within the particular SIG of the Kubernetes? Yes. Um, oops, sorry. Yes. Um, so so um, as we, or as you probably know, uh, Kubernetes is very broad. So all the topics that we discuss at KubeCon, they range from security to scaling to contributor experience. So we have like a very wide range of topics that we need to cover. And to make sense of all of this, we have a special interest groups, as you mentioned. So basically just divide and conquer this complex problem, have like hubs of teams who just um, share their knowledge and can own this part of the community's community. And um, to get involved in one of those six is kind of, I would say, um, pretty standard across all the six. So you have always a communication channel over Slack. So there's the community Slack. You can join one of those channels. 
um, and then you can just ask your questions. There's also a repository um, with documentation how to uh, join off one of these meetings. Um, you can just reach out directly. Um, and some of these SIGs are also owning code. Um, and if they are owning code, they are usually labels or there are always labels uh, in the community's community um, repository. So you can look out for those labels and just browse the issues. Um, these are some common ways. Um, I just want to add on to that, like understand the experience of starting within the repos and everything is really hard, but you can just come to any of the meetings. They're completely open to the public. Anyone can come. We often introduce ourselves at the beginning of the meetings and it's very welcoming. And I find that that's the best place to actually understand the needs of the SIG and where you can kind of step in and where do you need help. Um, so how you can do that is join the Slack channel, look for the meeting, invite at that to your calendar and yeah, just attend. And I think through that process, if you attend those meetings regularly, you kind of build a rapport with folks and they kind of know who you are and they're more willing to help you along the way. That's, that's, that's very good. So you, you basically got a definition of what exactly is SIG. But let's go ahead and further understand. So if we look at Grace, she is a part of, the, she has been the previous release lead. Uh, Meha is the current uh, release shadow lead, right? Faika is also in the part of the release team and Leo has already been um, in the part of the release team several times. So we can generally say like we have the release team right now or maybe the future release leaders. So any student who tries to get involved with the Kubernetes release team, they generally have this program called as release shadow program and it's kind of tough to get in, right? So what are the, some of the patterns that we have seen within the folks who have got rejected from maybe from the release shadow program maybe it can be something like not attending the meetings or anything can be like that so anyone of you would like to add some points to that as well um, maybe I can give some context. So I ran the um, 1.28 release. Um, I was involved in the release process since 1.22 and part of that is like reading the applications and selecting members for my team um, and first and foremost, our goal is to put out a quality Kubernetes release because that's obviously really important for the ecosystem. Um, and so for folks who, you know, are not accepted into the team, um, my, and it's really competitive these days, I think the acceptance rates is something ridiculous, like maybe 7 to 10%. Um, my advice to you is look around in the community. There's lots of places that need help and would love to see you there. Um, and once you've built a little bit more experience, come back um, and apply again. We do give extra consideration to folks who've applied multiple times. We do ask that on the survey. Mia, yeah, would you like to add some points to it? Yes, sure. So as while I was being a lead in the CI signal, uh, I got a chance to like uh, choose the folks. So what I have considered is like, uh, we need to consider that the shadows give the uh, proper uh, time to uh, analyze the things like they have the proper bandwidth because what happens is like if we are selecting the random shadow shadows then all the work should be done by us and this is not what it means for be because you also need to put some enough time and you need to learn the process like what the lead is uh, responsible to do right so yes and also the second factor the lead need to consider is like we need to consider from the geographical region so we we can't only focus on the simple one region and take all the folks from there so yes that was the one thing and yes the another is like contributions and some experience like totally fresher if you are just stepping into a uh, release team I would suggest it is not a good idea because uh, if you have done put in some efforts uh, beforehand it would be good for you so yes Actually, I want to add on to that. Um, we just, just for context, when I got accepted in the release team, I didn't have any open source experience. I was just doing Kubernetes in my internship. Um, and the thing I put on my application was a hackathon project that I cared a lot about. I was like a foster management system. And I, I talked about, you know, the reason about, about why I built it, how I built it, um, and how I pitch it, and, you know, the process of working with folks to build that project. Um, so, so I understand that, like, contributing to open source is hard. Um, and you can show your work, your public work, and it might not be open source work, might be, you know, your school club, something that um, you've demonstrated that you've put an effort over time that can be considered as well. 
you know, I was working uh, for writing a blog on the SIG release and at the question I have is like, what are some of the patterns? And the SIG release leads a road like maybe not attending the meetings, uh, just write some answers that depicts your interest that you really want to work with the Kubernetes release team. That being said, um, so whenever any student tries to get involved, whether he or she's in at any point of his career, right? Uh, there's some time commitment as well that you have to give to the open source contribution, whether it's Kubernetes or whether it's any project. So, uh, Faika, you have been, uh, as uh, you were, you're a college student, right? Grace is also a college student. Meha, you are uh, working at a company. So, if I ask you, like, how do you manage, balance your time, like the work-life balance and contributing to the open source project? Because most of the students or any other generally find it difficult managing both of it. So any one of you would like to go ahead and share your experience or what are the strategies or tips maybe you would like you implement while uh, doing some stuff? Oh yeah, so I'll go next. Uh, the thing is that I'm still a student. I'm in my final year right now. So I started as a student and obviously like any student, we have a like really tight schedule. We have so many things to do. We have our college, we have our assignments, examinations, and then we also have families. <laughs> so with that said, I definitely had a very, very, very uh, low bandwidth when it came to managing open source and your college studies. So how I did, that's like really, really interesting question. I'm, I'm really interested in answering that reason being I have, uh, been following a template on spreadsheet, I guess, to manage my time like really properly. I mean, what, what I do exactly is that I have a spreadsheet template. I've been following it I, where I write and actually monitor my time, what exactly I do every single day. So I have my task list, I have my weekly goals, I have my monthly goals written on it. And I divide that spreadsheet. I, I, I'm actually uh, very interested in telling you all how exactly that spreadsheet looks like. So it is something like I have my, uh, in the rows, there are all the dates. So it's like one uh, day, sorry, not dates, it's days, Monday, Sunday, uh, all those days. And in the columns, I have the times and the time is divided into like one hour. So this way I'm able to actually divide every single day how much work I'm doing and just below all the timing, like we have 24 hours, 24 columns, just below it I have my task list. That is where I actually wake up in the morning, I write down, okay, these are the things I need to do and within this, this time limit, I complete it within that time limit and I just have a checkbox next to it. So that's how I manage my time as a student, I would say. I really want to share that template. I guess you all can connect with me on Twitter. So my Twitter handle is one F YKA, and I would be really interested in sharing what exactly the template looks like. And so, yeah, below the template, I also have my weekly goals and my monthly goals. Those are like areas and it's like a really cool template that I have, which I follow in order to manage my time better. That's one thing, but it doesn't make sense to say that just having a spreadsheet would give me extra hours of the day. So that's obviously one more thing. Uh, yeah, definitely we have to uh, skip sometimes our sleep schedule. We, ha we have to sleep six hours a day and uh, some days manage things that way. So I like, I had this, uh, I had it this way. I will only give three days to my college and academics and I, the rest of the days is for open source and I'm pretty bad with managing my personal life. So I do not have much fun in life. So that's how I do it. I guess, yeah, that's my answer. Maybe I can also add to this. So in open source, you can um, contribute to not just code, but also documentation and organizing events and managing uh, working groups, founding maybe a new SIG, something like this. So um, the contribution can be like a very wide range of things. Um, and at least at my university, I was always able to talk to my professors about how can we maybe change this project in a way that is using maybe open source. So you can kind of um, move it in a direction where you can hit um, two projects at once. So you contribute to open source, but you also learn something for university. So it goes hand in hand. Um, I think, uh, I mean, without this, it's, it's impossible for me to manage the time because it needs to go hand in hand. I don't, I don't have uh, infinite time. I need eight hours of sleep, not six. <laughs> So um, I think um, 
always talking to your professor or to, to your person, maybe at work, um, who is in charge of the outline and just kind of trying the best to organize the um, interests. Um, I think this, this, can, this can help a lot. So to me, like I'm working a full-time job and like uh, doing the open source contribution is a big thing, like finding a time for it. So yes, what I do is like uh, in working days, I have some uh, job work. So I do that and in weekends, like I focus on uh, to uh, sp sparing some time for the contributions. Like I see if I need to do any PR reviews or need my inputs or someone needs any help. Uh, so yes, uh, I do like work days and weekends to the open source. So yes, you, this way you can manage. That's that's pretty. So you have a, you know, monthly goals, monthly goals divided into weekly goals and then weekly goals into days. That's, that's amazing. Um, I'll, I'll again come back to the first question that I asked you, Leo, but uh, specifically to you, Ficup. So if I look at you, you have been contributing to various aspects of Kubernetes, whether it's writing the LWKD, uh, for all those who don't know LWKD's latest week Kubernetes development news, right? So FICA is working with that. You have been the part of the release team. Um, how did you manage to navigate the document? You, you know, having a mentor sport is really great. And I think the SIG Contribux has bunch of good mentors, like for example, Madhav is sitting here, uh, Nikita is also there. So bunch of good mentors, but that being said, um, how did you try to go through the navigate the Kubernetes documentation and point out like, this is a thing that I want to work for. What is the thing that, uh, what is the way that you approach the mentors? Hey, I would like to work on this thing. And how did you do that? So would you like to give something to it? Oh yeah. So I'm not sure if you're going to come to a question where, uh, what should be the best resources for students? I'm not sure of that, but if you're asking me about uh, how do you navigate the documentation? So I would just say I have not seen a documentation as good as Kubernetes anywhere. So the Kubernetes documentation on GitHub is just fabulous. So if you just read through it carefully, you will understand every bit of it. So I would just say I just went through the documents. It was very complicated, though even though, because it was my first time contributing to open source, so it was complicated. Otherwise, for the ones who have already contributed to other open source projects, it would be like the simplest thing to crack. For me, it was my first time, so I was just going through the documents. I was seeing SIGs, WGs, what are these words? I have no clue. Uh, but after giving it several reads, I was able to figure out what exactly that means. And then there were also the names of SIG chairs, SIG leads, and all those things mentioned, and sub-project leads, and stuff. So what was my next point of contact was the SIG project leads, uh, sub-project leads, not exactly SIG project leads. So I would suggest if in case someone wants to navigate, they should definitely first go on GitHub. GitHub has really, really good uh, repositories. Uh, just the first page of Kubernetes will have you all the links to the SIGs and stuff. And once you uh, navigate through all the SIGs, you read through their documentations, you'll find out which exactly interests you the most. And after that, if you are still not able to understand something, join Slack. And I would suggest not exactly reach out the SIG chairs because they have particularly low bandwidth. They are like the people at the most, I would say. So it's better if you uh, reach out to the SIG sub project leads to understand the project better. So that's one like really good tip. Even I got, I did that and it would be really helpful. So if you want to navigate to the, through the project, it's better if you reach out to some of the sub project leads or even on Slack, if you're not getting a response if, or if you want it to be a more private DM. So that's one thing. I guess that's the way I did it. I reached out to several folks that way and yeah, I was able to figure Anyone it out. Anyone of you have ID? Add, want to add something to it? Anyone of you? Not so much on like navigating the docs, but like related to docs. I think there's like a lot of um, contribution that can be done to docs um, to you know make it as fabulous as it, as it is. And I, I just want to put it, the idea out there that like if you see something in the docs that can be improved, or if you're like really good at I don't know navigating API scheduling or like API machinery, and you have opinions about things like that, you can comment on issues. You can just LGTM uh, PRs, like read through them, understand them, comment them. There, there's not a permission like 
structure within Kubernetes. You can show up and uh, put in your opinions. Um, if they're you know informative and respectful, they'll be well received. Um, I think that's the biggest learning for me as a student coming from an academic environment. I was always looking for like permission, like can I do this thing? Um, but that's not the case in open source. So my suggestion is see that something, first start with something that you can handle on your own mostly. Um, do that thing and like write good questions. We see, well, I personally get a lot of DMs from people who are like, how can I get started with Kubernetes and I don't have the bandwidth to help with that. But if you can, you know, come up with like an informative uh, question of like, hey, I saw this issue or I would like to work on this issue. I looked at X, Y, Z, um, I have experience in this. Can you point me to more places? Um, and slowly you just do, do more and more of that and you kind of build a reputation within the community. Um, and who knows, you can, you know, start becoming an approver and move up the chain to become maintainer. That's how most people start, yeah. Uh, I would like to follow up on the, what Grace said. So yes, like uh, while I was a Google Summer of Code Manti, what I did was uh, as I so, as soon as I have shorted out few projects, uh, I tried hands on to see like how interesting it is. So uh, what I did was like uh, some technical questions was there, like in which I was facing some difficulty, like I was when I was trying to uh, run it, deploy it, some thing. So yes, uh, I reached out to the mentors, not the with the higher overview question, but with the more deeper technical thing, like how this uh, configuration, why it is not working, I am facing with this uh, specification, can you please help me? So by this thing, they will able to reach out to you soon and they will answer you quickly. So this is the way like you can do, like first try hands on and then reach out. So yes. I think when it comes to reach out, I, I got a very good lesson from one of the amazing community members from the Kate's Dems. He told me that always do your homework first. So don't always ask questions, but always do your homework first. Uh, the maintainer should know or any person should know like you have put some efforts to find your answer. You, you could not find it. Okay, let's help that, right? Um, we have a short benefit for that, but I have one last question for each one of you. So in the Kubernetes community, uh, who is that one person you would like to give a shout out in this panel discussion? So, um, uh, Leo, would you like to start that? Sure. Um, so I think this is like a very difficult uh, question because uh, over years, there are so many people who are actually influencing you and helping you out, um, contributing to the project. But I think over the time, I would give out definitely a shout out to Joseph. Uh, Joseph Sandoval, um, he was also today, if you caught um, the keynote uh, on stage um, moderating um, one of the discussions, um, he's, he's awesome, giving always a lot of help. And yeah. Uh, so about shout out, I really admire a lot of folks at Kubernetes, it's very difficult for me. But uh, I would go with the person uh, who's helped, uh, I think who helped me to get started with Kubernetes. So it was just like I joined some mailing list. I started joining um, calls, Zoom calls of a particular SIG and that was SIG Contribux comms. And so I would like to give the shout out to the SIG Contribux comms lead, which was Kaisleen Fields. She really helped me a lot. She herself DM'd me and uh, helped me figure out which SIG should I choose next. And that was the way I started contributing to the last week in Kubernetes development newsletter and spotlight blogs. And now I'm moving to the coding side of things. So it was my beginning and I would like to give her a shout out. So yes, to me, it's uh, like he's Dims. Uh, he helped me a lot. Like uh, he came up with a 30 minute call on a Zoom call like, and he explained me very well. So yes, that was the starting point. So I would like, I would like to shout out Dims, yes. <laughs> It's, it's hard to shout out one person, um, but I think Leo shout out kind of SIG release leadership already. So I'm gonna give a shout out to the SIG security uh, chair who is uh, Tabby and Ian. They create a very welcoming environment. So join our, join our weekly meetings. 
you all gave shout out to one people or asked, so let me try to give shout out to four people because you already have one 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 so um for me a lot of amazing contributors are there but specifically i would like to give a shout out to madhav who is sitting there nikita who is already sitting there uh dims is the person marco everyone so of all the amazing mentors you will get in the kubernetes community and i think that's it for our panel discussions uh now we would like to proceed with the question that you have and we'll make sure that each one of your question gets answered so um, yes you have a question uh So I, I can speak about my university. So at my university, um, there is no um, program or no course who really talks in depth about open source and not about open source contributions. I mean, open source is always mentioned like on the side and there's like communities, but everything is like pretty much still in the dark and there's not uh, a lot of guidance, at least not from my professors. But um, we had courses about uh, cloud, or also like touch the cloud at least. And the CNCF was mentioned and also the landscape. So there's like some, um, you're getting curious when you see like this gigantic landscape and all those cool tools. And then um, you kind of do it yourself. You go into repositories on websites and do some research. So. So to answer that question again, so there hasn't been things from academic, but I have seen there are CNCF groups forming right now at all of our colleges. That is one thing that's happening like really great. And that is promoting a lot of CNCF things. So that is one thing I am having at my college. And I guess all of this, who, uh, whosoever from us as a student might have one CNCF group at their college as well. We have community groups, city community groups, and that is how we are able to promote cloud native and Kubernetes contributions at our college level. So it's still starting, but it's not done by the education board. It's done basically by the CNCF community groups. And maybe also one thing to add, I, I just remember at the CNCF, we have like a very fresh initiative um, to define like a study program for uh, students. So this is from Contributor Experience. They have a new working group in the works and they are already um, working with professors of several universities about brainstorming how a cloud native um, onboarding at universities could look like. So there's stuff happening. Um, any other further question? Anyone of you have? Yeah. Uh, so you've talked a lot about, like, given shout outs to so many folks. Can you talk a little bit about what you plan to do going forward to grow more folks into the community and how you're going to act as that force multiplier? That's a tough question, but who's going to answer that? Yeah, I think um, both Leo and I have been really sleet and we ran a team of about 30 people and a lot of that involved mentoring for the next generation of the release team. Um, I'm coming back as an advisor for 1.30, um, but I think that I, there's a point there that there's not a lot of formal mentoring um, within uh, other side of, of Kubernetes. Um, and so I'm looking forward to kind of helping folks. I've, I've been talking to folks to onboard them to the security self-assessment subgroup because it's a newer project and we do need help there. Um, yeah. Yes, I would also like to add. Uh, right now, uh, being a release lead shadow, uh, like I'm learning how to manage all the sub teams uh, uh, together and manage uh, all of them, like 
managing uh, the blockage if they are facing and try to resolve them. So yes, I'm learning all these uh, things uh, while being a shadow. So yes, I have planned to give back uh, like uh, to the community. Like uh, I have planned to be a lead, uh, maybe in future, um, not the next immediate next one. But yes, as soon as I will find the bandwidth, like uh, I will definitely plan to release, uh, like being a release lead. And also maybe I am also involved with sub, uh, some of the mentoring programs, like right now customized mentoring program is going on, which is really well handled by Natasha and uh, um, one other person, I forgot the name. So yes, uh, Natasha is uh, very good, uh, like managing this customized mentoring cohort. Uh, so also I have plan to contribute to that project. So yes, that's my plan. Awesome. Uh, any last question before we wrap up the session? Uh, yeah. So I know a lot of you said that you take out personal time, weekends, and you, it, it somewhat impacts your personal life, uh, having to contribute to Kubernetes and open source. So like, I'm curious to know what inspires you, what in, to continue doing this, and even if it impacts your personal life and weekends. So. Yeah, well, honestly, it's the en environment at Kubernetes. Honestly, I've been contributing to some real other open source projects. I never felt so collaborative as much as I do at Kubernetes. So it's just the people there who are so humble, always looking forward to help you, the humility that you get from folks there, everyone wanting you to develop yourself. So I think that is one of the inspiration for me, to be very honest. Uh, as, apart from that, you have already seen students like us joining Kubernetes and going at a lead level, uh, becoming chairs of the community, getting opportunities to, you know, be between the senior most people of the community. So where do you get all these things? Obviously only in open source. So that's one of our motivation to be between those people, network with them and yeah, find opportunities. Hello? Yes. Um, yeah, so I, I think what motivates me also a lot is um, that you are never really getting pushed back. So if you have an idea, like something that you may want to change or you, something you, you're just thinking about, the community is always super nice and helpful and also supports you and you can test things out. So if you want to, I don't know, start like a project or something, Nobody will tell you this is like a stupid idea. We don't have like the resources. <laughs> this is maybe something that you may hear at work um, for like also understandable reasons. But at the community, you can test things out. You can um, be a little bit creative. Um, and especially as students where you don't really may know where you want to go. Um, there are a lot of roles, a lot of fields in software. You can test yourself out and um, that motivates me, yeah. Yeah, y'all can reach us out on our socials. I hope you all have the link. You can scan the QR and leave us a feedback for the session. Thank you. Thank you.